Welcome to Maple Avenue Christian Church, a great place to connect, grow, serve, and share. We hope that through today's service, you will connect with God and build community with Christ's followers. Please use the online form to let us know how we can pray for you this week. If you are worshiping in person, you can fill out a connection card located at the back. To help us stay better connected, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook. Don't forget to turn on notifications so that you don't miss a thing. You can also contact the church office to be added to our email updates. Here's what's going on at MACC. Sermon questions for small group or personal reflection are now available on our website or at the back of the worship center. Tonight, youth group will meet from 6 to 7.30 here at MACC. We are excited to be doing a modified super start this year with a few area churches at Lemoyne Christian Service Camp. This is for fourth through sixth graders on March 27th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Register on our website for just $25 by February 21st for a free t-shirt. Our annual Passover meal will be March 31st. You must sign up on our website to attend. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to check out our website, follow us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay updated throughout the week. But for now, you can't say we didn't tell you. Would you please stand? And before we begin this morning by praising God in song, I just want to encourage you to take a few moments uh, in silent prayer and just prepare your hearts and minds for worship with the body this morning. Clear anything out that's um, maybe clouding your worship this morning, that's causing you to not listen to the Father this morning. Um, just, take, just take a few moments and do that right now before we begin.
come before you, and we hope that our praise is an acceptable offering, that you delight in our voices being raised to you. We thank you that we have this opportunity to come together when so many others don't, when so many others have to meet um, in such a way that doesn't get them killed. God, we have such a blessing here. May we never forget that we um, can come together with our brothers and sisters and we can worship you. We don't have to fear for life. We can sing freely. We can worship you freely. We can pray freely. May we never take that for granted, God. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, whom you sent for us, that perfect sacrifice that allows us to live with you forever. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Would you continue in your worship this morning by greeting those around you? said was <laughs> good morning and it's good to have you guys here this morning um, as we're going through this part of our worship this morning if you're comfortable taking your mask off you're more than welcome to do so now um, if you're new or just returning uh, we're glad to hear uh, to see you and it's, it's glad that you could be here this morning also want to remind you when we do communion this morning when we go through that uh, there are communion uh, individual communions in the back so if you need to get up and get that when we get to our communion time uh, just remind you to do that we won't be handing those out um, we are in a in a series that we started uh, just a couple of weeks ago it's the the first week, we're in a series called Doubt. And the first week, what we did is we tackled the issue of doubt and faith. Uh, how oftentimes doubt can creep into our lives. It can challenge our faith. It can cause us to question our relationship with God. And a lot of people have asked, you know, how can I really trust in this Jesus who uh, churches talk about, who people of faith talk about all the time? Uh, and then last week, we talked about how, uh, how doubt can creep into our lives during the storms of life and so we talked about those we talked about how we can overcome that through the power of christ because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world and today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about doubt when things go wrong and when i say when things go wrong i'm not necessarily talking about those big thunderstorms of life not the not the blizzards not the hurricanes and tornadoes that come into our lives and rip us apart and and tear everything up and destroy families but when just things go wrong I don't know if you're like me but I've noticed that I personally can have a hard time trusting God when it seems like everything's going wrong I mean it just creeps in now it doesn't set up and take camp there but there's times it just there's that thought just that moment where it's like things just man God really things why do, why is everything in the world just going wrong have I stepped outside of your favor? Am I not in your will? And I just get all self-consumed, self-absorbed, and I think everything's about me when things go wrong. I don't know if you're like that at all. Probably not, but I am. I've had that struggle from time to time. You know, maybe you've been praying for a loved one for days, weeks, months, even years, and nothing changes. Maybe you have a loved one who's been struggling with migraines or, or with cancer or whatever it is, uh, ailments, and we just pray for them and pray for them and, and it doesn't seem like anything changes. Maybe you find yourself 
faithful as it can be to God's economic plan. You follow Scripture and, and you, you live according to Scripture in your e economics and your finances, and all of a sudden it seems like everything just breaks loose and you're in a hole. And you don't see any way of getting out. You've lost everything. And maybe you start asking questions like, God, is it even worth it to tithe? <laughs> Is it worth it to give to missions? Is it worth it to give to a building fund? I mean, is it ever going to get done? And we find ourselves doubting when things go wrong. Or maybe you've been praying for deliverance from a sin or a situation. And you just can't get over that hump. And you find yourself falling right back into that mud puddle. You don't want to sit there and make mud pies. But you just keep falling in. You're trying to get out. So what do we do? And why is it that God seems so far away when we're going through these times of life when things go wrong? Why does God seem silent? Well, the good news is that there's always something we can do, and the better news is that God never abandons us. Just like we talked about last week. I don't know if you remember, but last week we talked about how God never leaves us nor forsakes us. And I hope you've remembered that this week. I hope you have claimed that at different times in your life, you know, whenever things were going wrong. I hope you just said, God, I know you're never going to leave me. You're never going to forsake me. I hope you'll do that this week. Just make that a part of your life. Just make that something that you can just draw back to, just to give you hope, to give you assurance. A few things before we go any further. I want to say the pain, the fear, the confusion, the frustration, the doubt that you may be experiencing right now today, or maybe that you experienced last week, or that you're getting ready to experience, I want to say this, and I say this in love, but it's not unique to you. It's not unique to you. Now, that may not sound very compassionate, but it's true, and we need to understand that. Your situation, and here's what I mean by that, your situation, believe it or not, is no surprise to God. Now, it might be a, a, a surprise to you, but it is not a surprise to God. You're not going to throw him off his game, not for a minute. So it's not unique to you. You're not alone in that. Nothing's too difficult for God. Not a thing in the world. Nothing you'll go through is too difficult or too big for him. Even when you feel overpowered, overshadowed, even when you feel defeated, when you feel doubt creeping in, it's not too big for him. There's a passage of scripture that comes to my mind as, as we talk about having doubt when things go wrong. It's, it's a pretty familiar passage uh, to, to some. Uh, others of you, you may have never heard it before. But I believe it can bring some great encouragement when it seems like the world's against us when it seems like things are going wrong. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to read verses 8 and 9, those two verses. And uh, if you would, uh, would you please stand as we read God's word together this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, this is what we'll work through. And the Apostle Paul, writing his second letter to this church in Corinth, and remember we went through the book of 1 Corinthians last year, we talked about how the Corinthians were being introduced to all these different kinds of false teachings, and, and I'm sure some of those false teachings probably included folks who would say things like, hey, as long as you're in God's will, life's going to run smooth, because we still have those kinds of false teachers in our world today. But listen to how the Apostle Paul talks about his faith in Christ. He says this, we are hard-pressed on every side. Now, this is what you sign up for when you sign up to be a Christian. When you accept Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, Paul's saying this. He says, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Bring it on. It's going to be tough, and we're not going to be crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. I may not have the answers to everything, but I'm not going to despair over it. That's what he's saying. He's saying, we'll be persecuted, but not abandoned. What a great promise. I hope you can claim that promise. Struck down, but not destroyed. This sounds like a battle cry by the Apostle Paul. You can have a seat. And I love it. When it seems like everything in the world is going wrong, how can we keep from letting doubt 
defeat us. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. When it seems like everything in the world's going wrong, how do we keep uh, from letting doubt defeat us? And the very first thing, okay, the very first thing I think we have to do is to let God guide you. God has to be your guide. He has to guide us through every step of it. Any of you folks ever heard of the names of John or Helen Collins from Wisconsin? Probably not. But John and Helen Collins. Helen uh, and John were flying in a small aircraft one time, and Helen Collins landed this small aircraft with absolutely no flying experience in the plane she was in. Now, her husband, John, he was the pilot. And while they were flying, he collapsed at the controls while they were way up high in the sky. It was only the two of them, nobody else there. Helen ultimately landed the plane safely, but only because she listened to another pilot who guided her on the radio so that she could land that craft. So what's this got to do with trusting God? Well, can you imagine being thousands of feet in the air, not knowing what to do at the controls of a plane, and landing that sucker? Could you imagine that? Just think about it for a moment. You know, sometimes flying high in a plane at thousands of feet uh, with somebody passed out at the controls might feel safer than driving with the person sitting beside you. I understand that. But just imagine that. Just being up there. No control. Nobody's in control, and you're just left there listening to somebody else who's safely on the ground trying to walk you through step by step to land this plane. She was terrified just like we probably would be. Thousands of feet, not knowing how to fly. She was confused, she was frightened, she was in distress, which can happen when things go wrong. It's important to listen for God's instruction in the midst of our crisis as well. He knows how to help you navigate safely through whatever situation you find yourself in. And I know that a lot of us, we just prefer that God would take control and, and just take it over and we wouldn't have to mess with anything. But more, than all, more often than not, God wants us to go through these crises step by step because he wants us to learn something. One thing I can assure you is that irrespective of what you're going through, uh, he is as calm as can be. You're not throwing God off his game. It grieves him that you're in distress. And the reason it grieves him that you're in distress is because he looks at you as his child. And there's not a parent in here who wouldn't be distressed when their child is in a tough situation. Every one of us in here are children of somebody. And our parents may, more than likely, they grieved whenever we were in distress. And probably we created some of that stress on them. We brought it on. So what I want to encourage us to do is we've got to make sure that we listen to God's instruction when we're going through times of life when things go wrong. Now, your emotions may be running high. Time may not be on your side, but you have to go somewhere quiet, I believe, and just try to listen. You have to center down. That's the way A.W. Tozer used to call it. Just center down in your soul. Listen to God when things go wrong. Most people want to hear God's voice when they're facing a crisis. If only God would just speak to me and tell me what I need to do, tell me which direction I need to take, then everything would be okay. And many people will claim that they've heard the voice of God saying, hey, God led me to this decision or that decision, when in fact it may have been, more than likely, simply your thoughts or your desires or your emotions in that particular situation. The primary way a Christian hears the voice of God is through reading and studying God's Word. This is called God's revelation to man. This is a special revelation, and this is the way God reveals himself to us, is through his Word. Now, he has also given us the gift of his Holy Spirit. And so the gift of the Holy Spirit and the, re- and the gift of God's Word are the ways that we hear, is the ways that God speaks to us. It's the ways in which we can make decisions when things go wrong. 
But we have to be in his word. We have to pray over his word. We have to allow his word to be applied to our lives. We must surrender to it. Do what it says. But there's also the Holy Spirit who can speak into our lives, who can encourage us. And people often rely upon the leading of the Holy Spirit, which is spoken of in Romans 8, 14. I believe in the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So as we read his word, as we're being led by the Spirit, we can make our decisions. Now listen, this passage that Paul talks about in Romans 8, 14, in context, the passage speaks of the Spirit's leading us away from sinful activity and into a confidence in our relationship with God. Now I want to tell you, if you have confidence in your relationship with God, when things go wrong in life, you can have peace. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean you're going to be happy 24-7, but you can have peace. You can have joy, even when things go wrong. But one thing we have to make sure that we pay attention to is that the Holy Spirit will never lead us contrary to what Scripture says. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I've run into people time and time again who say, well, the Holy Spirit told me I need to do this, and it does run contrary to what Scripture says. That's not the Holy Spirit leading you. That's your emotions leading you. That's your thoughts leading you. The Holy Spirit does not lead us contrary to the Word of God. They work together. And they can lead us that way. And you can ask God to speak through Scripture. You can ask Him to speak through the Holy Spirit to let you know somehow. Then what we need to do is we need to wait. We need to wait expectantly. What God says to you will be vital. When He speaks, you'll know. When it's revealed, you'll understand. He may tell you to take action. He may tell you to be still. And you probably have friends telling you to do something contrary to God, so you need to make sure you're listening to God and not your friends. <laughs> you need to make sure you're listening to God and not, and not your emotions. Whatever it is, obey and follow through with what God is revealing to you. When it seems like everything is going wrong, how is it that we can keep from letting doubt defeat us? Well, remember where your faith is founded. You have to remember where your faith is founded, okay? You have to let God guide you, and then you have to remember where your faith is founded. When things go wrong, our faith gets shaken. More often than not, our faith gets shaken. We start to question what we believe. We didn't expect to be where we are, and God seems so far away. Surely, surely he would have shielded us from all these difficulties that we're going through, right? I mean, I've been a good person. His promises, all of a sudden, they seem questionable. But wait, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning, to when you first started trusting God. Let me ask you this question. Was there ever a time that God promised that nothing unexpected would ever happen to you? God ever promised that to any one of us? Is that anywhere in his word? Do you follow me? Nothing unexpected is going to happen to you. No, that's never been a promise from God to us. Not at all. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, 33? Jesus said this. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In him you may have peace. Not in the circumstances going on around you, but in him, in Christ we can have peace. In him, you can have peace. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. He speaks as one with absolute assurance about this. John 16, 33, look at it. You will have trouble in this world. That's his promise to those of us who sign up to follow Jesus. You're going to have trouble. But you can have peace in me. And then listen to what he says at the end of this verse. This is what really should give us Give us some encouragement. He says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Listen, folks. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Christ has overcome the world. Satan's going to throw things at us. He's going to try and distract us. He's going to try and discourage us. He's going to try and make things go wrong. And how are we going to respond? 
How we respond is what shows the world uh, how we are in our relationship with God. Jesus is saying, nothing you can face is too hard for me to solve. Nothing you face is too hard for me to help you overcome. Let me ask you, how many of us believe that? How many of us in, in the hardest things of life, when things are going wrong at the greatest depths, how many of us really believe that? I hope you do. And if you don't, I hope you will. I pray that you will. That's my hope and prayer, is that whenever doubts come, when things go wrong, that you can know that you can have peace in Christ no matter what's coming your way. And listen, it will come your way. You won't come out of this life unscathed. How many of us claim that promise? I want to encourage you to claim that promise on your life. And it doesn't mean you're going to get riches. It doesn't mean your health's not going to be deteriorating over time. It doesn't mean that. It means you can have peace, which is the greatest thing you can know. It's better than material possessions and wealth. It's the peace of God. So going back to the foundation of your faith, Here's the question I want you to ask. Is your faith dependent upon your circumstances or is it dependent upon God? That's a serious question that each and every one of us needs to wrestle with. Remember that he wants our faith to have no limits. We should not say, I'll trust God as long as, you know, whatever it is. Things go right. He blesses me. I feel good. No, he wants us to trust him regardless of what's going on in our life. The foundation of our faith should be God himself, not the circumstances of life. But I know you've met people like that. I know you've met people who, who have faith when things are good and they doubt when things are tough. Pray for them. Encourage them. And if that's you, let us know. Let us pray for you. Let us encourage you. The foundation of our faith should be God himself. And that's what it means to be founded on the rock. We trust him, even when in the flesh there's no reason to, to, to trust. When we look at it from, through human eyes, there's no reason to trust. And please don't think that I'm making light of your situation. I'm not. I, I really am not. I know it's difficult to remain faithful when things go wrong, but here's the beauty of it. God will give you the grace you need to get through. He will absolutely pour out his grace so that you can get through it. Remember God's promise to Israel in Isaiah 41.10. God said this, he said, so do not fear, for I am with you. Don't have fear about this, don't doubt this. I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So remember where your faith is founded. And when it seems like everything's going wrong, how is it that we can keep from letting doubt defeat us? Well, when we're knocked down, we get back up again. All right? You're going to get knocked down. The Apostle Paul says in verse 9, he says, we get struck down but not destroyed. I like that. We're going to get struck down. We don't have to be destroyed. J.B. Phillips offers us this memorable paraphrase. He says, we may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. I like that. I can get knocked down, but I'm not going, I'm not going to get knocked out. Not when I rely on Christ. If you live long enough, you'll be hit with a sucker punch sooner or later. Every one of us will. The term struck down comes from the Greek root word katabalo. And it refers to the sudden, it's, and that word katabalo, folks, what it's talking about, here's what it's talking about for us to understand. It's that sudden emergency. Okay? It's that, wow, right in the middle of everything's going right, something went wrong. It's that sudden emergency. It's that unforeseen incident. It's that late night phone call that we dread. That's what this word's referring to. That's what it's describing. It's the crisis that seems to come out of nowhere. The catastrophe that overwhelms us. The earthquake of trouble that rocks our world. The flood of emotions that drown us. That's what Paul's saying. We're struck down. Katabalo. 
but we're not knocked out. We're not destroyed. Most of us feel like we can handle moderate trouble. We can handle the cranky boss or the, the sick child or the prickly neighbor. We know what to do when we have a fender bender or when electricity goes off. We can scrimp for a few days when the money's tight and we know uh, when we're sick enough that we need a doctor because we know that into each life a little rain has to fall. We know where to find the umbrella when uh, that we see those dark clouds rolling in. But what are we going to do when the rain becomes a thunderstorm and the thunderstorm becomes a flood? What then? I don't know if you're a fan of his or not. I'm not a fan of his life personally, but I was a big fan of the heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson. And he famously remarked, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And it's true. We all have a plan until we get punched in the mouth. If you live long enough, you're going to get punched in the mouth probably more than once. Some of us physically, some of us figuratively. But we're going to get punched in the mouth. Sometimes you'll see the, the punch coming. And sometimes, and more often than not, it's going to come out of nowhere. It's a big mistake to think that God promises to shield his children from the slings and the arrows of, the, of outrageous fortune. What happens to others happens to us too. We get sick, our children get sick, we get laid off, the recession takes our savings away, COVID puts us on lockdown for months, the chemo doesn't always work, and sometimes we end up in divorce court. What then? More and more I'm convinced that our best apologetic to the world is not some clever argument to make that we want to make to prove that Jesus really rose from the grave. Clever arguments can only take you so far. Our friends will judge our Christianity mostly by how we respond when we take it on the chin, when we get punched in the mouth. Tim Keller says, we need a theology of suffering if we're going to reach this generation. If Christians are truly the light of the world, when is it that the light most brightly shines? When is the light most clearly seen? In the bright sun of the midday or in the deep darkness of midnight? When do you see the light the best? Now the answer is obvious, isn't it? And it's not as if we have to choose. You see, we are called to be the light of the world 24 hours a day. But our testimony, given in the midst of hardship, in the midst of sorrow and pain and suffering and doubt and heartache, will resonate more loudly, will be seen more brightly at midnight than at midday. But if you can still sing at midnight, the world will hear you in a different way. When it seems like everything's going wrong, how can we keep from letting doubt defeat us? Well, we have to remember that God is with us even when it doesn't make sense. God's with us even when it doesn't make sense. Some of you may be here today and you find yourself smack dab in the middle of when things go wrong. And so maybe your mind is racing. Maybe you're trying to make sense of the whole situation and you just can't stop thinking about whatever it is. I want to say this to you. God's purpose, and whenever things go wrong, God's purpose can be right in the middle of what seems to be like utter chaos to you. Don't try to make sense of it. Because a lot of times we... Um, end up only thinking endlessly about it what's more god knew that you'd face days like these and i believe that's why he gave us examples of encouragement through different books of the bible especially the book of job i believe that can be such an encouragement to us when we're going through things that go wrong and it may not it may not be your favorite book it doesn't have uh but it does have some great insights now you may be sitting there going dude I'm not Job. Why in the world do I need to look this? And you're right. You're not Job. You probably, you're probably a lot better off than Job ever was. I doubt that any of us 
had to bury seven children in one day. However, I know some of you have had to bury your children. And my heart hurts for you. And I'm sorry. I doubt that on that same day you lost everything you own, every possession. And I know you'd gladly give it all up to have our loved ones back with us. I also doubt that on that day you got so ill that you were skeletal and unrecognizable by the people closest to you. Though I'm sure, and I know some of us have been so sick that we have become unrecognizable to others. Remember, this is someone God said was blameless. Job was. He said, Job was upright, more than all men on the face of the earth. So in our human minds, we think, well, why in the world would Job have to go through this? Job was a human being like us and tried to understand why he experienced so much pain, yet he was a faithful servant of God. He didn't realize that God's ways are higher and they're better than anything we can imagine. Even the pain of life. Through his own reasoning, Job attempted to justify himself and in so doing, affirming that God was wrong. Anybody ever done that? You don't have to raise your hand, but you ever done that? God, you're wrong for making me go through this. I shouldn't have to go through this. Woe is me. He maintained that it was unfair that he lost everything good in his life. Job thought it right that he uh, complained because everything seemed undeserved and God didn't appear interested in helping him at all. Somebody a lot smarter than me once told me, and that's not hard to do. I mean, there's a lot of you out there a lot smarter than me, but somebody a lot smarter than me once told me when things go wrong in my life, instead of saying, why me? I'm learning to say, why not me? That's the attitude we ought to have. When things go wrong, why not me? What makes me better? Why should I be immune to pain? Why should I be immune to suffering? So what was God thinking as he saw Job in pain? I believe the the answer is a lot simpler than we think sometimes. See, God was focused on the purpose behind the suffering. That's where we can struggle. We don't always see the purpose behind the suffering. He was thinking about how much good it was going to bring Job and how many generations after him would benefit from his experience. Well, for all the affliction, we know that Job was blameless and upright, right? There's no one like him in the whole earth. We can safely say that in his time, Job was the most righteous man in the world. We see that Job had such a deep trust and a deep love for God that when he found out he had lost all his wealth and all his children, he stood strong and he said, The Lord gave and the Lord's taken away. Blessed be his name. Not many of us can say this after the death of all our children, but Job did, and it showed how much he trusted God in the beginning. However, there was something else God wanted to give Job, something new for him to learn. After Job was afflicted by the devil with sickness, he showed by his words what he was lacking. Job was willing to trust God when he could make sense of it. But he had problems when he couldn't understand. This is the lesson that he had to learn. No matter what it may look like, as long as we remain in the will of God, there's a purpose at the center of our pain and our suffering and our affliction. Furthermore, if it, it, it's not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of many. In the end, Job got it all back. He got his health back, had more children, Seven sons, three daughters, just as before. Became twice as wealthy as he had been prior to his affliction. And more importantly, though, most importantly, he learned to trust God regardless. Even if he didn't uh, get all that back, he had learned to trust God. He learned to trust God in the pain. He learned to trust God in the affliction, in the heartache, in the sorrow. This is why I love 2 Corinthians 4. It meets us right in the middle of life. It meets us in the middle of when things go wrong. Are we under pressure? Sure we are. Do we get confused sometimes? Yeah, you bet. Do we face harsh criticism? Yep. 
Are we knocked down sometimes? Yep. That's life. That's reality. That's the truth for every follower of Jesus and even those who don't follow Jesus. The difference is how you respond. The Christian needs to get back up. If you thought following Christ was going to be a bed of roses, an easy walk, you ought to go back to the recruiting office and have a chat with whoever signed you up because being a Christian doesn't mean getting a free pass through life. Far from it. I love the way uh, J. Philip Arthur uh, Arthur, uh, summarizes the meaning of our text. He said, taken together, these four images that Paul talks about here tells us that Paul was a hard-headed realist with no romantic illusions about his service for God, far from depicting himself as a spiritual superhero blazing a trail of success like the comet across the first century sky, Paul portrayed himself as a groggy fighter reeling from a succession of near-lethal blows, surprised to find himself still on his feet and sure that if he was still standing, it was only by the grace of God. So what's this mean for us? Talked a little bit about the victorious Christian life. I'm all for it uh, as long as we understand victory the same way Paul did. Sometimes when I hear people talk about victory, it sounds uh, like they want some sort of experience that will deliver them from the trials and the struggles of life. They want to be lifted to a higher plane, to a higher life that will uh, preserve them from trouble. And it doesn't work that way. Life's hard. Things go wrong. We don't always win. We don't always get our way. Paul's view of victory means this. It means, yes, I face trouble every day, and sometimes I despair of my own life. I'm under pressure all the time. I get confused. People attack me. Sometimes I get knocked down by life. But I I have to rely on the power of Christ in those times. And that shows me how I can get up. That's what helps me. If I have victory, it's victory when things go wrong, not victory apart from things going wrong. And that's the message we need to hear today. When things go wrong, we're still victorious. Let me go back to the Collins for just a minute. Helen. Helen landed that plane. When she landed and got out, she had a broken vertebrae. Her husband, John, was pronounced dead at the hospital. Now, you may be thinking, well, man, Donnie, that doesn't sound like victory. Listen. Because... She listened to the instructions she needed. She came out victorious. Her husband died of a heart attack, and that's sad. But if she had not listened to the instructions, her son Richard would have lost both his mom and his dad that day. As long as we keep listening to God, especially when things go wrong, we'll still be victorious. My question for you is this. Will you listen to God when things go wrong? Will you stand and pray with me? Would you put your mask back on too, please? Father God, we want to just come to you first of all and thank you for being the lover of our soul. Thank you for being the one who keeps us safe when things go wrong. Thank you for having such compassion upon us that you walk us through each and every situation of life. And God, my prayer is that when things go wrong and things will go wrong in our life, that we will not doubt, but we will draw closer to you We'll draw near to you. We will allow you to be our rock and our foundation in which we build our lives upon. We thank you that we can have victory. And that victory comes through you. For that we are eternally grateful. For that we say thank you. 
Help us to honor you and glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Enter into this time of communion, we use physical items to remember what Christ did for us on the cross. The bread represents his body that was beaten, broken down, hanging from a tree. The juice represents his blood that he willingly poured out for us. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, this week was pretty rough. Um, Full of failures and regrets. That is why I'm so thankful for this moment. 
a physical reminder that no matter what I've done or what I'm going through, Christ loves me and he paid the price for me and he calls me to his own. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not what is unseen, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This week, this month, this year, whatever it is you guys are going through, whatever hardships you face, yes, we need to partner together and walk alongside each other in this journey, but just know that those things, those things that are seen, they're temporary. Christ's love is eternal. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you love us, and thank you that no matter what we've done, what we've been going through, that you call us to you. That's not to cheapen your grace, because we know we need to turn to you, and we need to repent, and we need to follow your truth. But thank you that your truth is mixed with discipline and mixed with love, and that you gave yourself for us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we get ready for offering, there's buckets in the back at each table that when you choose to give, you can just drop it in that for us. Let's pray. God, thank you that even though we are giving differently, and we're not passing plates around, that we're still able to, to give joyously to you. And thank you that you just want a small piece of us to give back to you so that your word can spread. So I just pray that we will... Embrace this opportunity to show our love to you and share our love with others. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Could you please stand and put your mask back on as we close out today? There is a hill
shine upon you and give you peace. Um, if you wouldn't mind helping us move the chairs, and the outside sections go against the sidewalls, and these uh, middle two come to the front. Have a great week.